one, two guests now. Claire Hasty, who's founder of the Long Covid Support Group. Good evening to you, Claire. Hi, good evening. Hi, Claire. Welcome back to the show. Nick Mitchell is with us as well. Uh, she's been suffering from a variety of long-term medical problems since contracting COVID-19 last year. Good evening to you, Nick. Hi, Kate. Hi. Hi, you're welcome onto the show. Claire, let's start with you first of all. This will be a welcome move, I know, but does it go far enough? Does the government need to think beyond key workers who are suffering from long COVID? I mean, obviously, in an ideal world, that would be the case. Um, I, I'm not sure what's, what's practical in, in reality. I think in the EU, there are several countries that, that are um, recognising uh, long, long COVID or indeed COVID as an occupational disease. So I think a good first step would be to get, at the very least, I think the government should be compensating frontline workers, be they um, people who work in supermarkets, teachers, um, obviously NHS workers, taxi drivers. Um, but ideally, you know, there's, a, there's a huge swathe of people who've been financially completely you know, left on their knees by this. Um, a lot of us, even almost a year on or even more than a year on in Nick's case, are unable to work. Um, and we don't know when we will be able to work, either through physical symptoms or cognitive impairment in my case. I can't concentrate enough to do my job. I don't know what the future holds for me financially. It's, it's actually really scary as a single parent of yeah. three children. You are founder of the Long Covid support group and this is a support group that you set up when Long Covid was not getting enough press, Claire. I know I've spoken to you a couple mm. of times on, on Times Radio and the support for your group and the numbers in your group have swelled and swelled mm. um, you know this is a long-term public health issue that that will carry on getting worse um, and yet it feels a little bit like we're always playing catch-up doesn't it I mean, this is such a vast and complex problem. We're actually calling for there to be some kind of dedicated minister that can has responsibility and remit across departments because this is more than a, than a Department of Health issue. It affects the DWP um, with, you know, with benefits and, and work and employment issues. It affects the Department of Education because children, a huge numbers of children, including my three, have long COVID and, and are struggling to, to with their schooling. It affects industry. It affects local government. It really, really is a, a cross-department mental issue. So we would really love to call for a, for a minister that has that accountability because we need to be on the shielding list. We need to be recognised as a disability so we have rights and protections at work. We need more money going into research and the money that's gone into research needs to be focused more on treatments. We don't need to have our symptoms told to us. We, we, we know that and we've got the ONS doing some great work on prevalence which needs to be refined as they recognise. But it's a massive complex issue and it needs it's a pandemic on the pandemic. Yeah. And and I think it needs more focus and more money and yeah. um, a more strategic approach to look at it holistically to the cost of yeah. to society. Uh, Nick Mitchell uh, has been suffering from long COVID for um, for how long, Nick? Over a year 14 now? Months now. 14, yeah, 14 months, months now. Yeah, 14 months. Tell me, um, tell me physically and mentally the issues that affect you that that stop you being able to work. Um, well, as, as Claire rightly said, obviously one of them is the cognitive impairment, so the brain fog. And to be honest, the complete exhaustion, it's become like a narcolepsy where I don't know when I'm going to fall asleep. I could be in the middle of a text message and I will just drop. My whole body weight will drop as though I'm having, um, as though I'm passing out. Um, and then I will go into a very deep sleep. And that deep sleep could be anything between 10 and 15, 18 hours a day sometimes. And it's not controllable. It's not manageable. So you couldn't book a meeting and say, I'm going to come and see you next Thursday because you'd have no idea if you'd even be awake in time. Um, and then physically, obviously, I, I can't walk more than a, a couple of hundred yards because I get out of breath. Claire's in a wheelchair. 93% um, of the group uh, that was surveyed uh, in conjunction with Body Politic and ONS have not been able to return to full-time work. And as Claire rightly says, I have had not a penny of any benefit, yes. not a COVID benefit. So you're getting nothing benefit. at all, Nick? No nothing, universal no. credit, nothing at all? So no, how, nothing. How are you surviving? Luckily, I've got a property that I rent out and I did I did have real problems getting any tenants, obviously, in the first pandemic because everyone wanted to be with their parents and their loved ones. Uh, but uh, more recently, I've managed, luckily, to get some nice professional tenants in who cover the cost and then give me a little bit more that I live on. And Claire, how are you coping? Because you're not able to work or work at all or work much. What's your situation? 
I'm not able to work at all at the mm. moment. I, I tried to go back after I'd been off work for six months. Um, I tried to go back two days a week, phased return. Um, but to do two days a week of old Claire's output was uh, yes. it took me more than full time evenings and weekends. I couldn't sleep. I wasn't seeing my kids. I, I, it nearly broke me. So I, I had to stop. And I don't know what the future holds. I've had to say to my, my, my employers, are thankfully really brilliant company, but I've had to say, I don't know when I will be able to come back unless I wake up one day in my, and my concentration and, and processing ability improves enormously, which maybe it can. I think we hear the odd you know, people in our group sometimes say that. Um, then I'm going to have to take some sort of unpaid leave in the hope yeah. that they keep my job open. But I'd understand yeah, if they don't do that. Mortgage. I've actually second mortgaged my house to release some capital. And I've also had to write begging letters to my pension company because I'm only a few years off being able to take my first or my biggest pension that I've been saving for for 30 years. Um, my life insurance company turned me down for a critical illness claim because they don't acknowledge that non-COVID recognized. even exists. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it needs to be on the critical illness list. That's a point I was also going to make because people's income protection um, policies are not paying out. Um, and I believe that's also the case for employers. I think their insurance is not paying out if they've got employees on long-term sick. So this is a huge societal cost and we need a, a really huge strategic approach to this. Um, I think it's it, sh- it shouldn't be looked at in, in the different departmental buckets. It, it needs... Yeah. yeah. Claire, your employer uh, is supporting you at the moment, but what happens when they turn around and say, actually, we just can't afford in this climate, we just can't afford to have you off long-term sick? That, that, that must scare you immensely when that day comes. Well, I'm on comes. annual leave at the moment. My sick pay is, is, is finished um, and I'm on annual leave at the moment, but that'll run out very soon. Um, and then I'll as I say, I, I, we, we decided we'd cross that bridge when we come to it, and so we haven't had the discussion quite yet, but I would floated the idea that maybe I have to try and take some sort of unpaid leave in the hope that they can keep my job open, but we don't know. No one's got a crystal ball, and that's and that's what the... I think this comes down to, in lots of ways, the absolute urgency of, of investing in research. The US um, NIH has, has invested $1.15 billion with a B, um, and I think they, they in recognition that this is a societal cost. So if you can find the research to help treat people and get them back into normal life, then that will be a lower cost in the long run. Um, we, we've invested in contrast 18.5 million. Yes. So much as that is welcome, I, it's a very different order of magnitude to what's being to invested what's being in done. the US. And it's also what where that project's money has gone to as well. Um, um, I think you know the applications were more than were more than two months ago now. Um, and I think in the intervening intervening period, there's some great research has come out that actually kind of removes the need for some of the elements of those projects that have been awarded the funding. So I think there's a need to really make sure that let's let's cherry pick the best bits from the, the, from the, from the wonderful projects that applied and, and make sure that everything is, is really focused on understanding the, maybe the though, genetics or the immunology or... Sorry, well, so sorry Nick, saying, come in. I, I, some people don't have a life expectancy of two to three years to wait two to three years to get more research back before we start administering some help. I think we need support. We actually need proper hands-on support. We need blood tests, MRIs, CT scan. We need people to be cured. I've been sitting here a year. I know my life expectancy is not going to last long enough. Okay. Uh, all right, Nick. Claire, final word to you then. Um, it's great that the government are looking at key workers. Perhaps that is some acknowledgement that long COVID is something that will need to be compensated for. And they're going to start with the, with the key workers. And surely that is some hope that they might then extend uh, the call to employers um, and to um, the um, social care sector as well to, to try, and, try and support you. Yeah, I think it just, as I said before, needs a, a very different strategic approach that looks at the holistic cost to society and works out what is the best way in the long run that maximises help for people right now? You know, we've a lot of us have been ill for, as Nick says, more than a year in her case, but coming up for a year, people's sick pay is running out, people's livelihoods have gone. There's an urgent, urgent need. People in our group are suicidal in some cases. I can't emphasise enough yes. how desperately we need help. Um, and I massively appreciate everyone's working so hard in the NHS and the government to help us, um, but we need to make sure that scarce resources are really directed to be on the critical path to getting treatment for us and for our children who are suffering so much.
Yep, and of course, giving you financial support at the same time. Thank you very yes. much, Claire Hasty, founder of the Long COVID Support Group. You can find them on Twitter and Facebook. And Nick Mitchell, part of that group, uh, but she's been suffering with COVID for 14, uh, with Long COVID for 14 months. Thank you to both of you for joining us here on Times Radio. Just to get